When we last left the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews were suffering, suffering from forced conversions, from confiscation of their property, uh, a situation which they had endured for over a century as a result of the Visigothic rule over the peninsula. Just to recall, uh, the Jews first arrived in the Iberian Peninsula, what today is Spain and Portugal, oh, I would say with the Romans, that the Romans extended their empire across the Mediterranean. Remember that there was some evidence, at least the first concrete evidence, that Jews were in the peninsula in the first few centuries of the Common Era. With the downfall of the Roman Empire and the ascension of the Visigoths, the successor state to the Romans, these Visigoths, who at first paid not much attention to their Jewish population, as we remember from last time, then turned against the Jews, issuing edicts to force conversion, as I said, and really causing much misery within the Jewish communities of the peninsula until the year 711. The traditional date that is given for the Muslim conquest of the peninsula is April 28, 711. There, at least according to the traditional sources, Tariq ibn Ziyad crossed the Straits of Gibraltar from what today is North Africa and landed on the southern coast of Spain in what today is called Gibraltar. All of the traditions about the Muslim conquest of the peninsula, at least in its details, are really subject to much doubt and questioning. But we do know that in the year 711, the Muslims do conquer, and the Visigoths proved absolutely no match for them. Within the space of about four months, the Muslims rout the Visigoths, and the Visigoths essentially retreat to the northern mountain ranges of the Iberian Peninsula where they keep their hopes alive about retaining their original crown, but which for a couple of centuries didn't really amount to any serious threat on the now dominant Muslims. And what about the Jews? What about the Jews who had suffered under the Visigoths? What do we know about their reaction to this conquest? Well, frankly, there are not many sources which indicate to us what the Jews did. Oh, to be sure, there are later Christian traditions from the 13th century. Lucas of Tui, who suggests that the Jews actually helped the Muslims, in fact, opened up the cities to them. This fit in very, very well with Lucas's notion of the Jews, a somewhat standard Christian interpretation of the 13th century, of the Jews as conspirators, as the Jews of being unreliable, and of course handing over that which is dear to the Christians to the foreign invaders. But as I said, there really is no evidence to support that notion of the Jews aiding the Muslims in their conquest. What we might want to think about is, would the Jews have aided the onrushing Muslims? Now that is a very, very interesting question. Islam had begun in the Arabian Peninsula, founded by the Prophet Muhammad, whose dates had generally given as the year 570 to approximately 632. Now, if we can look at our map right here, we will see that Muhammad was born in the city of Mecca. Uh, he then travels to the city of Medina. Over the course of Muhammad's lifetime, after overtures both to the Jewish and Christian populations, he announces himself as the prophet of the Arabian peoples, and slowly many people flock to his banner. With Muhammad's death in the year 632, the Arabian Peninsula, what today is called Saudi Arabia, as you see, at least in most of the peninsula, was under Muslim control. But after Muhammad died in the year 632, an extraordinary conquest ensued. In the space of about a couple of generations, Muslim forces burst out of the Arabian Peninsula conquering east as far as the Indus River in Pakistan and west across North Africa until 711 they were poised at the tip of North Africa and then in that fate-filled year crossed over the Straits 
not yet called the Straits of Gibraltar, and as I said, in a few short months, routed the Visigoths. Now, what did the Jews know about the Muslims? What did they know about their policies? Would indeed they have seen the Muslims as possible allies? Well, truth to be told, clearly the Visigoths were not the allies of the Jews, and the Jews may have sought support from anyone who would decide to defeat uh, the Visigothic rulers who had caused them so much pain and suffering over the last almost century. The Muslims, interestingly, over the course of this century and developing in the years afterwards, had developed a very sophisticated attitude towards the peoples whom they conquered. I mean, clearly the conquest which I just outlined made the Muslims in charge of a variety of peoples and religions which must have been quite dizzying for people whose origins were within the Arabian Peninsula and its culture. Well, the Muslims began to divide the world, or at least the world's population, into three parts. There was the Dar al-Islam, the world of Islam, which meant those who were Muslim, born or converted to Islam, were to be considered first-class citizens. Then there was the Dar al-Kharb, oh, the world of the sword, people who were polytheists, who were supposed to be put to death in reality that was quite far from the truth. But then there was a third world, made up of a variety of peoples, whom the Muslims felt they could engage in peace treaties with. They could make with them a compromise. This was called the Dar al-Sukh. And among the most notable members of this Dar al-Sukh, the world of the pact, of the treaty, of the compromise, among the peoples were the Jews and the Christians. The Jews and the Christians famously were called peoples of the book. And now, towards these peoples of the book, towards this third world, this Dar al-Sukh, the Muslims granted them a variety of freedoms. Freedom to worship, freedom to practice their religion, to organize their own Jewish communities or Christian communities. Ah, yes, freedom of occupation, freedom of settlement. These were extraordinary, extraordinary freedoms, really extraordinary even by the standards of the seventh century. And you can imagine how attractive to Jews, who may have heard some earlier versions of these ideas, attractive to Jews who had suffered mightily under the Visigoths. Visigoths. But let's just remember our sense of whether the Jews were happy to see the Muslims come and defeat their former overlords, that is really a matter of conjecture. There is very little evidence that we have about the Jews in the first few years of the Muslim control over the peninsula. But slowly, there is evidence of Jews living within the cities, of Jews having connections to Muslim rulers, and fascinatingly as well, Jews by the 8th century making contacts with other Jews outside of the peninsula, in North Africa. Yes, in North Africa. And even in the 8th century and 9th century, as far east as the city of Baghdad. Baghdad was the capital of the Muslim Caliphate the Abbasids, starting in the year 750, and it was in the city of Baghdad as well, or at least in its environs, that the major Jewish communal leaders of the entire Jewish community under Islam resided there. This was ancient Babylonia, after all, to the Jews. So we do see the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula having these contacts with Jews outside of their small little at least comparably, comparatively rather, area of residence. You'll notice that I've been talking about the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula. Oh, we can also talk about now the Jews of Muslim Iberia. The Jews of Muslim Iberia were known as Andalusi Jews. Al-Andalus was the name of the Muslim territory in what was formerly the Spanish provinces of Rome or the Visigothic Empire. 
And the name Al-Andalus continues today in our name for southern Spain, Andalusia, and to its population, the Andalusians. But these were now known, our Jewish community were known as Andalusian Jews. Around the 10th century, the Jews began to also call themselves by another name, a name which many of you are going to recognize. The Jews in the 10th century will begin to call themselves Sepharadim, and they will call the land in which they live Sepharad. Now in modern Hebrew, Sepharad means Spain. But when did this association of the term Sepharad with a geographical entity in the Iberian Peninsula first come to be. And that truly was in the 10th century while the Jews were living under Islamic domination. The term Sepharad appears once in the Bible, in the small book, the prophetic book of Ovadia, Obadiah, and it, since it only has one chapter, we just say the book of Obadiah in verse 20, where there is a phrase that even today resonates and must have meant much to the Jews of the distant past. The prophet talks about the Galut Yerushalayim Asher B'Sfarad, the exiles of Jerusalem that are in Sepharad. What did Ovadio mean by Sepharad? Frankly, we are not exactly sure. But in the 10th century, Andalusi Jews looked at that phrase in the book of Obadiah and thought that that phrase truly reflected their own experience. Yes, these Jews in Al-Andalus imagined themselves as members of the Galut Yerushalayim, the exiles of Jerusalem, the glorious ancient capital of the Jewish people. Yes, these Jews imagined themselves as the nobility of the Jewish people, coming straight from the capital of their former state. Yes, the sounds of that phrase, the exiles of Jerusalem that are in Sepharad, truly resonated with them. And they began to adopt the name Sepharad to describe their land and Sepharadim to describe themselves. Now, this is something that should give us pause. While at first blush, we are struck by these Jews' self-concept and maybe applaud their own value, their own high estimation of their culture. But how are we to imagine that Jews, who we've said had suffered under the successive states of the Roman Empire, the Jews whom about whom we don't know much in the first years of the Islamic conquest, that these Jews begin to imagine themselves not only as a powerful Jewish community, but as the exiles of Jerusalem. What has transpired in the 10th century to give our newly named Sephardic Jews an extraordinary sense of self? The 12th century Jewish writer Avraham ibn Daud asked essentially the same question. Avraham ibn Daud was a noted philosopher, oh, the first amongst world jury to attempt to synthesize Judaism and Aristotelianism, as well the author of historical works, including the book Sefer Kabbalah, the Book of Tradition. And in fact, it's from this book of tradition that I report on what Avraham ibn Daud thought about uh, when he reflected on the sudden meteoric rise of Sephardic Jewry. Abraham Ibn Dawood asked the question, how did Sephardic Jewry reach such heights of cultural prominence? And he tells a wonderful story. He tells the story of four rabbis who are about to set sail for a rabbinic convention. He talks about these four rabbis embarking upon a trip from the southern port of Bari on the eastern coast of Italy, heading for a rabbinic convention in the town of Sifastin. 
Avraham ibn Dawood tells us that it's precisely the story of these four rabbis which eventually are going to help us understand the rise to power of Sephardic Jews and of other Jews throughout the Mediterranean. Avraham ibn Dawood asked the question, how Sephardic Jews attained such cultural prominence in the 10th century? And he tells a story, the story of the Muslim king of the Iberian Peninsula whose name was Abd al-Rahman. Historians know Abd al-Rahman and they append a number to his name, Abd al-Rahman III. Well, this Abd al-Rahman, who was the head of al-Andalus, had established the capital in the city of Cordova. In fact, Abd al-Rahman was quite a daring monarch. He not only had united the peninsula under his control, but he was beginning to imagine himself the head of an absolutely glorious nation. Abd al-Rahman builds in the city of Cordova a glittering capital, and all of these expenses force Abd al-Rahman to look for sources of revenue. And so Avraham ibn Dawood tells us that Abd al-Rahman of al-Andalus engages his naval captain, whose name is Ibn Rumachis, and he tells him to set sail from Cordova to enter the Mediterranean and, to put it bluntly, to raid coastal towns and to capture ships and bring the booty back home to al-Andalus what then may have been called a naval captain, we would more easily call his most trustworthy pirate. And so, Avraham ibn Dawood tells us that Ibn Rumachis heads off into the Mediterranean, goes as far as the land of Israel, and finds no boats to capture. Must have been a pretty sad time for our new friend, the pirate. But then, Ibn Da'ud tells us that Ibn Rumachis turns around, goes back through the Mediterranean, sails through the Greek islands, up the Adriatic, at the same moment that the four rabbis who had set sail from Bari are coming into the central Mediterranean. He captures their boat, takes over all of their belongings, and kidnaps these four individuals in order for them to be ransomed. If I may say so jokingly, I imagine that Ibn Rumachis had greater fantasies of what he could possibly capture on the high seas, maybe visions of uh, gold and silver, precious silks, maybe individuals who were well-known and notable individuals throughout the Mediterranean. But instead, he's a pirate and a professional one, and it's the boat with the four rabbis that he takes capture, and he then does what any good pirate does, attempts to find a place where he could sell these individuals around the Mediterranean, at least to gain some of their ransom money. These four rabbis didn't announce that they were distinguished rabbinical figures. There was always a concern that if you were kidnapped and you were known to be a notable person, your ransom price might be so elevated that it would be hard for people to pay out the money to gain the freedom of the people who are taken captive. And so Ibn Dawood tells us that one rabbi was sold on the coast of Egypt. Another one sold on the coast of North Africa, but yet another rabbi was sold, brought back to Al-Andalus, sold in the streets of Cordova. And this man, by the name of Rabbi Moshe, with his young son, whose name was Hanoch, was ransomed by the people of Cordova. And it's precisely the arrival of these two learned Jews, Rabbi Moshe and his son, that allows Sephardic Jewry to scale such great intellectual heights. Now, there isn't much evidence, aside from the story of Ibn Dawood, that such was the case. And in fact, it seems difficult for us to accept the notion that a Jewish community can all of a sudden develop such extraordinary cultural prowess simply by the arrival of two individuals who are going to be extraordinary educators. Yes, 
educators can uh, have great influence over a community, but not to such a great extent. But where else are we going to find evidence about why Sephardic juries, why Sephardic jury did become so prominent in the 10th century? And I think what we need to do is go back to the beginning of Ibn Daud's story. Yes, Abd al-Rahman III, yes, who unified the peninsula, who started building a glorious capital in Cordova, he was an exceptional figure. The 10th century was a time when the western corner of the Mediterranean, the Iberian Peninsula, was all of a sudden the central spot for an upsurge in commerce. People in this corner of the Mediterranean began to amass great amounts of wealth. Traders left what today is Spain and Portugal and traveled throughout the Mediterranean and even into the Near East. Ah, Al-Andalus now was able to wield great economic power. And it's against this background that Abd al-Rahman decided that yes, his was no longer going to be uh, the rule of a small individual, a person living at the far western corner of the Mediterranean, but rather Abd al-Rahman would take his rightful place within the Muslim world. And instead of paying obeisance to uh, the city of Baghdad, this being all one part of a large Islamic empire, Abd al-Rahman, the year 929, decides that his capital of Cordova is not just the capital of a local governor, but rather of a king. Abd al-Rahman sees himself as a caliph and declares independence from Baghdad. But economic wealth and political power did not simply satisfy Abd al-Rahman. Abd al-Rahman wants to create in his newly burgeoning city of Cordova a glittering capital which is going to be the cultural rival of any city in the great Islamic empire. And what Abd al-Rahman does is begin to gather scholars of Muslim language, rather scholars of Arabic and of Muslim literature of the holy writings of Islam from all over the Mediterranean and the Near East. He sends for scholars of the Quran, the Muslim holy book. He sends for scholars of the Muslim traditions, the Hadith which are ascribed to Muhammad, the Prophet. Abd al-Rahman sends for Muslim scholars of law, of great experts in literature, of poetry of great Muslim philosophers, of grammarians, of scientists, of mathematicians, gathers them from all over the Muslim world and by dint of his great wealth attracts them to come to his capital city of Cordova. And that was not all. Abdul Rahman builds libraries and he sends for manuscripts of great Muslim treasures of their great literary accomplishments from all over the Mediterranean and Near Eastern world. Ah, Cordova in the 10th century becomes a glittering capital in envy of all of Islam, and indeed, the fame of Cordova even stretches beyond. Abd al-Rahman was a wise monarch. Abd al-Rahman realizes that for his kingdom to be unified, for him to be successful, he has to make sure that all the peoples of his kingdom are working in unison to support his government. For those members of the peoples of the book, for those peoples of the book, he attracts them to work with him in his state administration. We have evidence of Jews working for Abd al-Rahman in his glittering new capital of Cordova. And yes, Abd al-Rahman works with the Jews as the Jews work alongside Muslim and Christian courtiers for his great grandeur and glory. The Jews, we imagine, who work aside the Muslims in this glittering capital of Al-Andalus with its wealth, with its extraordinary learning, with its burgeoning political power, 
these Jews begin to view the Muslim example as being something which they should emulate. The Jews are watching their children, their families, being attracted to glittering Islam. And they realize that if they're going to retain their Jewish community, if they're going to retain the allegiance of their people, then Judaism is going to have to learn much from its surroundings. Ah, the Jews watched wealthy Muslims patronizing great Islamic scholars, building great buildings, gathering manuscripts as did their king, and the Jews follow suit. The wealthy Jews who work with Abdul Rahman, those who are at the court, this new courtier class begins for sent to send for Jewish scholars from across the Mediterranean and Near Eastern worlds. If the Muslims gather scholars of the Quran, well then the Jews will bring to Al-Andalus, to Sepharad, yes, to Sepharad, scholars of the Bible. If the Muslims gather those students of the Hadith, then the Jews will invite scholars of the Talmud. Yes, like the Muslims, the Jews bring poets. The Jews gather together philosophers and scientists and grammarians and students of the Hebrew language to create a glorious Jewish culture which will rival the Andalusi Muslim culture. And indeed, the achievements of Andalusi Muslims amongst whom they live. And what a glorious culture the Sephardim created. Yes, the name Sepharad fit them very well. They saw themselves paralleling the Andalusi advance to the highest rank of the Islamic world. They saw themselves now as the most extraordinary Jewish community. Chasta ibn Shaput, a man who worked in the State Department for Abd al-Rahman, who was involved in some of Abd al-Rahman's diplomatic initiatives to the Christians in the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula, in his diplomatic initiatives in the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, and even in Byzantium, Chastai ibn Shaput takes part. But Chastai ibn Shaput, interestingly, one of the first of the great Sephardi courtiers, also sets the bar of what is demanded from such a Jew who comfortably walks in the court of the monarch, yet also sees himself as a proud Jew, both as a Jew uh, who is concerned about Jews all over the world, as well as the Jews in his own home country. Chasta ibn Shaput writes letters to the Jews of southern Italy, offering them his support at difficult times. He tries to help out the Jews of southern France, who seemingly are persecuted by the local Christians. Hearing about possible attacks on Byzantine Jewry, Chastai ibn Shabchut attempts to intervene. Chastai is aware of Jewish communities all over the world, even in that Jewish community called the Khazars, situated between the Black and the Caspian Seas. And at home, Chastai ibn Shaput follows the Muslim example. Not only Chastai ibn Shaput, but those individuals on his economic and political level, they were all dedicated to making sure that Sephardic Jewry and its accomplishments were well known amongst their Islamic brethren, were well known in the peninsula, and indeed were well known amongst Jewish communities worldwide. So what begins to emerge is not just Chastai ibn Shaput alone, but a courtier class made up of wealthy Sephardic Jews with great intellectual and cultural interests who make sure who give the appropriate funds to bring Jewish scholarship, both in terms of individuals and bring Jewish literature, the cream of Jewish literature, to their new homeland in Al-Andalus. And it's precisely at this moment, therefore, that Sephardic Jewish culture emerges. This is going to be an elitist culture. 
in elitist culture promoted by the best and brightest of Andalusi Jewry. It's this Jewish community and its accomplishments which are going to make an extraordinary impression not only on contemporary Jews or on contemporary Muslims, but indeed on generations and generations to come. Even to this day, you can read tales of the great golden age, the golden age of Sephardic Jewry, and often these writers are precisely pointing to this 10th century, when Abd al-Rahman's kingdom of al-Andalus was known throughout the Mediterranean Near Eastern world, and the Jews of his new and powerful political kingdom were able to claim preeminence amongst all Jewish communities of the Mediterranean.